God's word this morning. Can you please extend a warm welcome to Brother Bernard? Good morning, church, and shalom. May the peace of God be upon all of you. Now, today is a very special day. You know, we have just recently celebrated our Jubilee, and it is still very fresh in our mind, right? Two years ago, uh, today we are celebrating 52 years of God's goodness and faithfulness to us in CGBC here. Let's give God a big hand again. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And wish the one seated next to you happy anniversary. Okay. You know, so good to see so many uh, in church this morning. And uh, I would like to begin by just, you know, uh, telling you two very short stories just to, you know, liven up the atmosphere before we share something more serious uh, in the Word. You know, I, I came across uh, uh, these short stories. Okay. <laughs> you know, hopefully no, nobody misunderstand me. You know, there was this, uh, uh, in, in a court, where there was a divorce case, you know, where the judge finally pronounced a divorce. Lah, huh? So, the judge had to settle the matter about the child, only child, 10 year old. So, the child asked the, uh, the 10-year-old the boy, you know, I'm going to send you to live with your father. He said, okay. The boy said, no, I don't want to stay with my father because he always beat me. Okay? The judge says, How about I send you to lift uh, to stay with your mother? The boy, the 10 year old boy, again says, I don't want to live with my mother. My mother always beat me one. Then the judge asks him again, Then who do you want to, to stay with? The boy says, I want to stay with Manchester United. It seems that they never beat anybody. <laughs> Sorry for the Manchester United fans. Huh? <laughs> of course, their, their fortune have changed lately. Huh? They have won quite a, a few games lately, I was told. Another one. Okay, let's go for another one. After all, today is the anniversary. Huh? It's good to have some uh, fun and jokes. Huh? Okay. You know, there was this handsome young man. You know, he was so unfortunate. Huh? He couldn't get a ticket to the... The, the league premiership final. It seems all the tickets have been sold out. But he was very clever. Eh? A few days before the final, he put up, you know, a notice, an advertisement and says, you know, a handsome young man offer marriage to any woman who could give me a ticket to the premiership final. Those who are interested, please send in a photo of your ticket. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's so good to have fun. Anyway, let's pray now. Let's pray and let's gather in the Spirit and invite the Holy Spirit to come. Father, this morning, Lord, it is so good once again to come together because of you and celebrate, Lord, 52 years of your goodness and your faithfulness to every one of us. Lord, this morning, once again, we know that you are always new and you are always fresh to all of us. Let the Holy Spirit come and fill us, anoint us and move us, Father, as we hear, as we worship, as we praise. Let us do so, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Lord, this morning, let us have a fresh word from you that will not only excite us, but empower your people, Lord, to fulfill your purpose in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone says, Amen. Amen. Can I have the first slide? This morning, you know, I put just one word as my topic. Actually, if I want to uh, put it a little bit longer, I would say, Discipleship methodology, is it Jesus or ours? Alright, if you want to understand further, I will explain it more. But this morning, it is very uh, relevant as we celebrate our anniversary, 52 years into existence uh, in Canning Garden here. But perhaps we should look further. You know, how does the church do? You know, 
after all these years, and not just these 52 years in CGBC, uh, after the Lord had left us, went back to the Father in heaven. For almost 2,000 years, how has the church been doing? Have we really been pleasing the Lord? Is God the Father, you know, pleased with earth? You know, if God were to look at the church today, what would God say? Would He say, well done, church, or well done, CGBC? Now, we have to go back uh, into the beginning of the Word and see how the church has been doing. How well have we been doing? Or really, are we lacking? Or are we not really living and operating, you know, our purpose in life as it should be. So can I have the first words? Now, normally I would like to quote the Great Commission uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, but this morning I would like to quote something else from the Bible. I believe the Great Commission is not only mentioned in Matthew chapter 28, but throughout the Bible. Okay, this morning, let us just look at uh, two references. I always believed, you know, for preaching, don't quote too many Bible references. This is not a Bible class, all right? I am focusing in your heart, your emotion, not in your brain, not your mind. I would like to do so in a teaching class. But for preaching in the morning, let us just have two verses, okay? First one, shall we all read this together? All right? Three, two, one. You did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give it to you. Now, if we want to really know and assess and check ourselves, how well have we been doing as a church that is faithful to God, maybe these words will guide us. Can we have another one? The next one. Matthew chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Let us read this together again, okay? Three, two, one. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, I think it's quite clear from these two verses. You see, our purpose, you know, as a church, you know, before Jesus went back to heaven, you know, he has made it very clear how the church should exist, how the church should operate, how the church should fulfill you know, our purpose on earth when He is not around. And that is, we have to be fruitful, to bear fruit. You know? So what is, this, what is this fruit? Just now we read in John chapter 15. We get a clearer picture here. Jesus says, you know, I have called you. You come and follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. You won't be catching fishes. That will be in your mundane uh, vocation. But Jesus' you know, commandment to us is from now on, you are to catch men. Alright? Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now I believe there are a lot of important things in church that we must first do before we can fulfill our purpose as a church. But in God's heart, something that is most important will remain most important. Even though there are many important things, you know, that should happen in the church. For example, as we compare to the most important thing that is in God's heart is that, really, I'm just speaking on a comparison level, alright? I'm not speaking per se of that particular happening in the church. Like for example, God doesn't care how big your church is. What is your attendance? What is your membership? Even though that is important. God really, you know, is not most concerned about even how many people attended your prayer meeting, even though that is important in the beginning. God doesn't really put, it's so important how big your worship team is worship team is, how professional they are. What are the deep spiritual songs they sing? These are important but not the most important thing in the heart of God. So what is the most important thing that is our objective where all these other things will lead to is the fruit. 
What is this fruit that I, we are talking about? Are we touching another person's life? Are we inspiring another person's life? So much so that the person are willing to be changed and transformed. Are we bringing souls into the kingdom? Because these are the eternal things. Now, if I were to do a survey and a check among ourselves this morning, I would say, you know, like Mrs. Yi, you know, Auntie, Kim, and the rest of all the, the teachers, assistant teachers, helpers, you know, in the children's work, they, would, they will win hands down. You know why? One day, when we stand before the Lord, God will ask all the children, who has inspired you? You know, who has encouraged you? They would all say, Auntie Yi, you know, Miss uh, uh, Auntie Kim and all the KKC teachers inspired all these little children. And God would ask people, you know, ask us, who have you inspired? Who you have helped to change or make a difference in their life? Or how many souls that you have introduced, brought into the kingdom? What would you say? Now, a good reflection on how well we do, uh, very simple. Let us look back at our life from today, 12 months back. Let us look back up to January. Okay, let's say January of 2019. First of January until today. How many times have you shared or witnessed the gospel to somebody? And how many of these people whom you have witnessed share the gospel have come to faith? These are the fruit that God is most concerned about. Ask ourselves, then you will know how well you are doing. Why not this morning let us you know, do a more thorough check, examination, because I believe this is an important matter in the church. How well are we doing as a church? both as individual and corporately as a body of Christ, okay? Now, who shall we measure? And then we will know how well we are doing in life, you know, as the people of God. Let us go back right at the beginning when the church was birthed, okay? That would, that would be the best standard or measure that we could assess ourselves, all right? There are so many things we could measure and compare ourselves today with the early church, the church when it was born. All right, I will only quote three measures, okay? Three questions. Number one, if you really want to know how well you are doing, and once you know how well you are doing, then you will know, you know how you would, can catch up or how you can continue to do better. But we have to have an examination of ourselves first, Okay? Number one, as we compare to the first church in the book of Acts, you know, we were told in the early church when it was birthed, when the Holy Spirit came down, the church members sold their houses and their lands and bring the money to the church, you know, and put it at the apostles' feet. Correct or not? Anybody can refute me that the Bible did not say that? Acts, it did say that. Correct or not? How many of us, I mean, don't talk about other churches lah, huh? in CGBC, how many of you lately have sold your houses, some of your most precious property, land, for example? I don't mean you sell everything. Lah, huh? Don't sell everything. You will cause another problem for yourself. In the Bible, in the book of Acts, they never say they sold everything they have, but they sold precious things, houses, lands, and put it at the apostles' feet. That means bring it into the church. How many of us lately you have heard that someone has have done that in our midst in CGBC? God or not? None. Can you tell your 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 the one sitting next to you or the siege of? As we compare to the early church, we lost on this aspect. Number two, let's check ourselves again, okay? We were also told in the books of Acts, you know. The, the early church members, the disciples, you know, they gave up their career. Most of the early disciples, members of the church, Jesus first 12, for example, left their boats, left their nets, stopped being a fisherman in the sea 
and even sow you know, their boats and their nets and follow Jesus. Correct or not? How many of us in CGBC here that you have heard recently gave up their career, gave up their job, and decide to serve full time, answers God calling, moving out into the mission field or other marketplace ministry? God or not? God la a few. Okay? Got a few. But still, as we compare ourselves to the early church, tell your neighbor, the one sitting next to you, Yao Shi Jo. We lost on that aspect again. Alright? One more, one more comparison, okay? One more comparison. You know, those days, to be a disciple or follower of Jesus is very unpopular. Not popular. Even dangerous. Don't have to look at all the disciples. Most of them, especially the first twelve, they died for their faith. They refused to give up their faith in Jesus. Most of them died, sacrificed, give up their life for Jesus. Are there anyone in our midst here recently you heard died for Jesus? Anybody? Maybe in the last 10 years or 20 years, because of their faith in Jesus, died for Jesus. God or not? Tell your neighbor, what is suicide? We lost. We, come, we can't even come close to the early disciples of Jesus Christ. So how well are we doing today? You see, the disciples of Jesus are very important to the plan and the purpose of God. They are so fundamental. You see, after Jesus left, all that Jesus had accomplished and fulfilled on the cross now depends on the disciples to carry on the mission to make disciples of all nations throughout the world, you know, to glorify God. The disciples are the number one target of the enemy. You see, the devil, Satan, is really not afraid about how big your church is, how rich your church is, how deep your Bible knowledge is. The enemy, Satan, is not bothered at all. The enemy will only bother us when you start to share the gospel. When you attempt to witness, when you bring souls into the kingdom, the enemy will wake up. The enemy will pay attention to you. That's why most of us, ah, you're so scared of the enemy, you don't dare to witness. You leave evangelism behind, you put mission, your last resort. But this is where the gem is. If you really want to find a fulfilled life, begins to open up your mouth and talk about Jesus. This is where we are most fulfilled because John just now says, we are called to bear fruit. This fruit is about bringing glory to God through the testimony of our life and our mouth about Him, what He has accomplished on the cross both for man and for the world. This is the fruit. This is what the fishes of man will do. I find it very uh, apt or suitable or relevant to talk about this today because today is our church anniversary. How well have we done? Again, like I told you just now, the topic of today is also like this. Discipleship methodology. Is it Jesus method or our method? Could it be our method? Something has gone wrong. We have not been making disciples like the way Jesus did. We thought we are more clever. So we, we, we did it our way of making disciples. And what we come up with disciples today are really, by comparison to the early disciples, are really substandard. Substandard. Can you tell your neighbor, are you a substandard disciple? Are you the substandard? Now, I won't deny that you are a disciple. You are a follower of Jesus. But are you a substandard one? Can we look at ourselves? Because before we can make disciples of others, first of all, we have got to be disciples first. You know, it is very dangerous to disciple other people when you yourself are not a disciple. Because those people that you disciple, they are going to look like you. 
A disciple is basically a student. A student will learn from the teacher and they will be looking, speaking and behaving and acting like the teacher. So unless we ourselves are truly the disciples, we will set a wrong standard for others. So this morning, I believe we should relook at ourselves and relook at, at Scripture. How disciples are made. Jesus' way and not our way. Can somebody say Amen? Amen? I want you to agree with me because if you don't agree with me, no matter what I say on top here, it will not come out of you. And we will all be wasting our time. This morning, you know, as we gather, let us rejoice and be frank and humble before the Lord. We look at our life. How well have we been doing, you know, as a child of God, you know, as a church, corporately. Now, this morning, I believe uh, we have not been doing exactly like the way Jesus has trained, mentored, and coach disciples in his time. We should actually focus and we look at the four Gospels because the four Gospels capture everything that we needed to know, but not everything that Jesus has said and done. Remember, you remember John chapter 20 at the end of it. John says, you know, the very reason why he decided to write another Gospel is so that this time when he writes, his intention, his sole purpose, is so that he may choose the relevant material. Now, he did not write everything that Jesus said and done. He made it very clear at the end of John chapter 20. He says, Jesus did and said so many things. Not everything is captured in the Gospel, in the Bible. But he has chosen selectively, specifically, with an intention in his mind, this specific material in the Gospel of John, so that it will bring out the faith in you that you may continue to walk and to believe in Jesus Christ as a Savior and the Son of God. And also, let's go back to the Great Commission, all right, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. What was Jesus' suggestion? How do, are we going to make disciples? Jesus says, Go ye therefore, you know, Make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, the, the, verse 20 is important, and teach them everything that I have instructed you, and I will be with you until the end of the world. See, Jesus has already laid down His word. Make disciples. If you want to know how to make disciples, remember what I have taught you. Remember what I have coached you, trained you. Follow it. Follow Jesus' method, not our own method. So what is Jesus' method? I'm sure deep in your heart, you want to be a disciple. You want to please God and you want to have a fulfilled life you know, before we leave earth. If you have not really been a full disciple this morning, I hope this message is for you. So that you will also know how to make other disciples in our life. Let us this morning look at the Gospels again. What is Jesus' method? Okay? Now, this requires you to read all the four Gospels. You have to. There's no shortcut. By the way, uh, what John has written for John Gospel is actually very little. And this very little that he has written in the whole of the John Gospel of John, uh, I'm sure we can all read. Let me tell you, uh, you know, I, 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 my memory very bad. I brought my Bible as I come in. And then as I walk up here, I lost my Bible. <laughs> I don't know where. Anyone find my Bible, please return to me. Okay. Let me tell you. Actually, I want to show you. Many of us find it very difficult to read the whole gospel. You think it's very long. A lot of things to read. Let me tell you. Do a measurement. My Bible considered very big already. But every page is only a half size of A4. You see, I measured the thickness of the Gospel of John in my Bible. You know how thick? 1 cm only. The whole of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, until the last chapter, 
last verse in the Gospel of John, the thickness of the Gospel of John is only 1 cm. How thick is 1 cm? You see, if I put 1 cm, you can't even see. It's so thin, so little. Can it capture all that Jesus has done in three years? It can't. Jesus has spoken so many things. Jesus has done so many things. Jesus even worked at midnight, praying until, you know, sunrise. But John says, I only choose this very little material so that when you read and when you understand, your faith will arise. Now, I'm trying to, you know, show you the point that please pay attention to the gospel. It's so vital. What the author has written is so powerful. It can cause faith arise in you. And there, and it is not much. One cm thick money for John Gospel. Okay? Now let's look, talk about the, the four Gospels, including the first three. I summarize this. It, there are three levels of discipleship. Can I have the next slide? This is the first level. I call it the Logos level. And everybody say Logos. Now this word is not really unfamiliar to you. Ah. If you look at John Gospel, the word, word, ah, for example, John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the word. The word actually is in English, but in the original Greek is Logos. Let me rephrase it again. John chapter 1, right at the beginning, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Logos, the word that John, the author, used it to describe, to define Jesus, the Son of God. See, right at the beginning, John understand Jesus' methodology. How did Jesus train disciples, make disciples? The first level is the Logos. Logos actually means logic or reason. You see, at the beginning of the gospel, at the beginning of discipleship, God wants to give us you know, a reason and a logic for us to ponder and compare with our current philosophy of life about man, about God. God wants to give us, you know, a platform to re-evaluate what we think and what we understand about life and about God. That's why Jesus will always begin with the Logos. The Logos in an, is an appeal to your mind, your thinking, your mental capacity, your intellect. Jesus always began his ministry by teaching. You remember that? Right in the first gospel in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, 6 and 7. You see, in the midst where every man, you know, see ourselves, there are so much need. We want to hear the truth. We want to know the truth. And Jesus began with Logos. Because he is the Logos. He says, you know, Blessed are those who are poor in the spirit, for theirs is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Church, do you understand what does that mean or not? Jesus is saying that those who are very weak, who doesn't understand any spiritual matters, where you really are, are really a foreigner, you know nothing about spiritual matters, you are blessed because the kingdom of God belongs to you. But it still doesn't make sense, right? What has, you know, giving a kingdom of God to someone, you know, who are so poor in spiritual matters, look more like a contrast, opposite end. But let's look at it carefully. Jesus is a very uh, clever teacher. You know, if you understand the word that he uses, you will understand his meaning. When you are poor, for example, when you are poor, you are in great needs. You have many needs. But look at the most important needs. You, you lack of food, you lack of drink, your lack of clothing, your lack of a, 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 a roof over your head, basic needs. So when you are poor, what happens to people who are very poor in their most basic needs? 
people who are poor, people who are hungry always think about food, correct? People who are thirsty will always think about drink, isn't it? Those people who sleep on the streets, one, the homeless, they will always think of a warm home to go back to. See, when you look at the word poor, Jesus is telling you the opposite will happen. Because when you are hungry, you will always be thinking about food. When you are thirsty, you will be always thinking about drink. When you have, don't have a roof, don't have a home to stay, you will always think about a home to go back to. When you are poor in the spirit, really poor in the spirit, you will be thinking about spiritual things. And as you seek for spiritual things, the kingdom of God is for you. So what Jesus is saying, for those who seek, they will find. Ask, it shall be given. Knock on the door, the door will be opened unto you. Do you understand this morning, church? Blessed are those who are poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus began with the law gospel. You see, it stirs people's mind. It stirs the thought. Blessed are those who are pure in your heart, for you shall see God. Blessed are those who mourn, you are going to be comforted. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those, you know, who are persecuted because you are seeking for righteousness, you shall be rewarded. Understand? Blessed are those who are meek, those who are humble, you shall inherit the earth. And then Jesus go on to fulfill the logos, you know, in our deep spiritual needs in our mind. Jesus continued to say, I am the bread of life. When you eat of this bread, you will never be hungry again. Does this stir your interest or not? I am the bread of life. You know, I am a good shepherd. If you are seeking for a guide, someone who could protect you, provide for you, Jesus says, I am a good shepherd. I am the light of the world. If you are confused about which is the truth in the world today, so many philosophies, so many teaching religion, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Immediate, your, immediately your, your mind will be focused on Him. I am the gate. I am the truth, you know, the way and the life. I am the resurrection and life. I am the vineyard. Jesus began with logic and reason for you to ponder. Come on, think about it. Are you on the right path? I'm giving you an option. This is the truth. But that is not enough to make you a disciple. Knowing the truth, understanding the truth, receiving the truth is only one third way. Not enough to make you a full disciple. You know, not too long ago, you know, I was in Deborah's cell, at C cell. You know, there was this brother who brought up a question. A very good brother. I always admire him. Not sure whether I should quote his name or not. Never got his permission yet. He asked a question, you know, in the Bible study, during the Bible study time. You know, how come we church, we are not lack of knowledge in the Bible? You know, we have Bible study every cell time, every week. They come to church to hear sermon, preachers from all over the place. You know, we are quite full of truth and of the knowledge of God. But how come our lives are not commensurate with what you know? This is a very frank and honest question. Perhaps it represents what you want to ask. He was asking the question. How come we already know but somehow our lives are not reflective about what we know. In fact, you know that you know so much. You know, you come to church every Sunday, we thank God for it. You have been, you know, uh, feed, fed with the Word of God week after week. How come our lives are not commensurate with the knowledge you know, of the Word of God? A very frank question. So I answer him. Knowing the word of God is not enough to make you a disciple. Can you tell the one sitting next to you? Not enough. You may have gone to Bible college. You, you, 
you, you might have taken your bachelor, your master, or even your doctorate in theology. Tell your neighbor, it is still not enough to make you a disciple. It is good, huh, of course, to get all this, huh, to get your, your theological training. It is good, but it is not enough. If you think that it is enough, you are fooling yourself. Because in your life, you will realize there is still a vacuum inside of you. There will still be a thirst inside of you because you know so much come, sometimes. Let me tell you, knowing too much of the Word of God, that can be dangerous one. Knowing too much because if it is not reflective of your lifestyle and your behavior, it can become a poison. That's why Paul says, you know, there are people, in, even in his time, who put on a form of godliness, very religious, but devoid of his power, devoid of the power of God. You are just putting on a religious form. You are a goody, goody person, but you have got no power to change life. Nobody is blessed by you. You are only, you know, being blessed by your own self. So what is needed? Jesus went on. Now, I'm only summarizing this. You can read the four Gospels and you will come to the same conclusion. Having the law of God is not enough. Sometimes if you are only full of the knowledge you know, of the Word of God and are not you know, behaving the way that you know the Word of God, you can become very proud one, I'm telling you. You can't even avoid it. It's natural. If you know so much of the Word of God, you will think so highly about yourself that you know more than others. And in the process, you will become proud. That's why I say it can be toxic. If you know too much and are not coming, if the word is not coming out of your life. Alright? So Logos is good, but it's not enough. What is the second level? Can I have the next slide? Pathos. Everybody say pathos. P-A-T-H-O-S. What is pathos? Pathos is the way that the Greek, you know, the learned people, the philosophers, uh, they are all very clever teachers. They, they know how to, you know, teach and train and coach people. This is a Greek word, pathos. Pathos is an appeal to your emotion. Now, logos is an appeal to your mind. That's why it's full of logic, full of reasons. You know, to appeal to your intellectual capacity. But pathos is different. Like I'm doing more of pathos this morning on the pulpit here because I'm preaching. Logos is more for the Bible study classroom. Okay? You've got plenty of time. Quote all the Bible verses you want to. But when it comes to pathos, I am now focusing on your emotion. I'm hoping to move your emotion so that your emotion will agree with your mind. I'm sure you, you, you know, isn't it? Our mind and our heart are two different entities, two different things. They are not the same. The mind is a mind, the heart is a heart. And sometimes they can disagree one, you know. True or not? Sometimes the mind and the heart can disagree. And Jesus knows. So Jesus moved on to the next level. Because giving you the logos, the truth, is not enough to move you, connecting with God through our mind is good. It's fundamental. It is the beginning of a relationship with God. But it is only the beginning, not the end. That's why it is not enough. Logos connect our mind with God. Beginning. We have to move on to the pathos level. We have got to connect with God through our emotion on a heart-to-heart -heart level. Pathos is an appeal to the emotion so that it can activate a response now from your logic, from your mind. A lot of people knowing things are, but they don't, they don't do one, you know that. Do I need to <laughs> convince? A lot of us have been know things are, but we never do one. Ah, I don't need to give examples, ah, no time. I can give you 101 examples that we know a lot of things that is good, that is true, but it never come out from your life. You never do it. That's why Logos by itself is not enough. You've got to move on to, to pathos. To strengthen you, to evoke a response from you. Uh, let's go back into the Bible. Huh? 
So many examples, again, I cannot quote to you. You see, the authors of all the Gospels, they have experienced all this. They were disciples. The first generation disciples of Jesus, they knew Jesus' methodology. That's why as they pen down, you know, in the Gospel of what Jesus said and did, they know that this is Jesus' discipleship method. So they write it very carefully. Do you, you know why the Gospel, besides teaching, there is another a chunk of record of events, happenings, dialogue sessions, besides the Sermon on the Mount, you know, for example, some of these specific events, uh, Jesus meeting up with people, the Samaritan woman, despite, you know, being a broken woman, being a Samaritan, uh, John chapter 4, I'm quoting one of the hundreds of examples. Uh, you see, she is not only a segregated sect uh, from the Jews, the Samaritan, but she herself is also a despised woman among her own Samaritan people. That's why she has to find a quiet afternoon where there are nobody near the well, then only she come out and draw water. She was so afraid to meet up with people who would despise her, look down on her because of her status. She was a very broken woman, especially in relationship. And Jesus met her. Jesus never condemned her at all, despite her background. I'm sure all of you know her background. I've mentioned it here many times. Jesus never condemned her at all. And some more, you know, carry a religious, deep conversation with her about the coming Messiah, the Christ. You know, this Samaritan woman was so elated meeting with Jesus, hearing, you know, living water where she drinks, she will never be thirsty again. You know, after the meeting with Jesus, you know what happened to her? Immediately, she became one of the best disciples. She went back to her village, Sika, and tell everybody about Jesus. And the whole villages, the whole village were converted because of her. You know, after her encounter with Jesus, the episode that Jesus was actually ministering to her heart. She was so broken, unforgiven, bitter. Everybody, everyone despised her. But Jesus valued her and gave her back the value of a woman. She was so happy and excited. She went back and evangelized her own village. Everyone came to faith. Can you see her turn around? Pathos. Jesus was appealing to her emotion. Any example? Zacchaeus. You know Zacchaeus? Huh? Zacchaeus was well known. Maybe for the wrong reason. Huh? Chief of tax collector. Not only a tax collector, but chief. Now, normally, a tax collector is nothing but it's a good job, ma, right? But the problem with Zacchaeus, he was collecting tax not for Jerusalem, but for the Roman, for the occupier of uh, Israel. That's why everyone hates him. The chief of tax collector. Taking money from us and giving it to the foreigner. He was very much misunderstood by people, the rich and the famous. You know, today, there are a lot of Zacchaeus in our midst. You know, in our mind, in our normal thinking, we often think, oh, rich people, ah. Yo, all these sinners, ah. all these popular people, ah. Datuk, ah, Tan Sri, ah, all these, ah. oh, get all these titles, ah, must be true, all these uh, back doorway ones. You know? This is our general impression about the rich and the famous. But not every rich and famous and popular people are what you think they are. Zacchaeus is a good example. Everyone doesn't like Zacchaeus. He has to climb up a tree when he heard that Jesus is coming to town. You see, when he saw Jesus, you know, it was not him that called out to Jesus. Jesus was the one that called out to him. He said, Zacche Zacchaeus, today I want to go to your house for dinner. Salvation has come to your house. What? Those people around Jesus and Zacchaeus, they were thinking so differently. They said, how can this Savior be like this. Everyone knows that Zacchaeus is a big sinner. Biggest sinner in the whole world. How can this Savior go and fraternize and fellowship with him? Jesus can never be a Savior. But Jesus has made it very clear. I came not to condemn. I came not to serve. Uh, to be served, but to serve. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Immediately, 
after Jesus said that, you see the true self of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus said, if I have cheated anyone, please come and see me. I will pay you four times. Well, it's a very daring challenge, you know. Anyone dare to do that here? If you have cheated anybody, I will pay you four times. Zacchaeus says, do you know that even though I am rich, but I give half of my riches to the poor. Jesus knew Zacchaeus that most people does not know. Now, there are a lot of Zacchaeus in our midst. Very pathetic. Look, misunderstood by people. Even though they are rich and famous, but people look at them differently. So Jesus came and renewed Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was so happy and excited to meet up with Jesus. Finally, he finds someone who truly understands him. That's who Zacchaeus is. Can you ask the one sitting next to you, are you a Zacchaeus? No, let me tell you, don't be humble. There are a lot of Zacchaeus in our midst. Uh, rich and famous. Okay? So many incidents. There's another one. You see, where Jesus is really ministering to the heart of people. Zacchaeus, let me tell you, you can understand yourself. Immediately become an active disciple of Jesus. Look at Peter. Don't look so far. Peter the disciple. Peter, I'm not sure whether Peter represents any one of us here. Very sure and convinced of himself. He told Jesus, even if other disciples you know, desert you, I will not. I will be the most faithful one. I will remain with you. And even if you go to jail, I will go with you. I'm willing even to die for you, Lord. Uh, that's the word of Jesus. I'm sure many of us sometimes we say this kind of thing. Uh. I will die for the church. I will die for Jesus. I will die for my faith. Maybe there are some Peters in our midst. Look at what happened to Peter. Jesus told him, before the cock crow, you are going to deny me three times. You see, Jesus knew Peter more than Peter you know, know himself. And when that thing happened, that Peter really did deny Jesus three times, and when the cock finally crows, Peter was cut to the heart. He cried and he cried. He denied Jesus in a way that I'm sure you also would not deny Jesus like this. And the Roman soldiers come to him and say, Ah, you are one of those that are close to Jesus, that whom we have arrested. We will charge you also. You know what Peter says? Peter says, ah, I find it in Cantonese more funny. I, I, I don't know Jesus. I'm not very close to him. I don't even know him. And we were told that Peter even cursed. Nah, I can't curse. Ah, I don't know how to curse. Peter even cursed. And people accuse him of knowing Jesus. So when finally the chicken crow, Peter cried. He was so cut to the heart. And Jesus knew it. Jesus purposely arranged for the whole thing so that my disciple Peter will really know and become a disciple. He cried and cried. You know what happened after that? Peter became a changed man. Please look through the four Gospels. There are so many stories where the authors purposely captured it in the Gospel for you to know that we have got to be touched in the heart, to be connected in the heart with God, with Jesus, before we can be willing to give up your life for Him. If you think that you only know the Bible, know the truth is enough, sorry, lah, it's not enough. But when your trials, when your temptation come, you are going to give up. You're going to run for your life. But let your heart be touched first. So, you see, in our church discipleship, please expose yourself. Ask yourself, how is your emotion today? Do you shed tears, cry when you hear testimony, when you watch a very sad movie, or when you, you know, uh, come across a situation, a very pathetic, needy situation? Do you shed any tears? Or are you having a very hard heart? inside of you. Have you cried in, your, in the last 12 months? Is your, is your emotion so hard to change? It is a bad sign, church. Nowadays, uh, when, I, when I watch those simple stories, touching stories from China in the Facebook, uh, I also start to shed tears. When my son saw me, I quickly turned my face. A bit embarrassing. 60-year-old man still crying. Yes, I'm watching a small stories. Let me tell you, it's good. It's good that you learn to cry again. Because if the sensitivity is not there in your emotion, it's very difficult 
for God to touch you. Learn to cry again. Be sensitive. Because if you are not sympathetic with people, you cannot feel for other people if you cannot put yourself in the shoes of need of other people who are in need. It's very difficult for God to use you because you have no feeling. So if I want to make you a disciple, I will expose you to a situation whereby you can see, you can feel, you can experience the needs of other people, the environment. Then only you have hope. Otherwise, really no hope. You will be so puffed up with your knowledge of God in your logos. But when it come to pathos, you are so poor, you are so empty. You cannot feel for people. Difficult for God to use you. Now, some people is enough, and when they reach to pathos level, they're enough to be convinced. So they follow Jesus, they give up their life for God. But still, actually, it's not enough. You know why? Our entire being, our real identity is your soul. And your soul is not just made up of your mind and your emotion. There is another part of your soul that also needs convincing. That is the most powerful part and that is your will. Can I have the last one? Ethos. Everybody say ethos. Ethos actually is the original word for ethic. Moral. You see, in our nature, when you know something that is morally right or morally wrong, you will do what is right and you don't dare to touch what is morally wrong. Wrong. Jesus know this part of nature inside of us. Ethos is actually relating to your will. It's an appeal to your moral and activate a change in your behavior. Your will is your behavior. Many of us, even when you are convinced in the mind and in the heart, it is still enough. It, it is still not enough. You still not need to go deep to another level, and that is your ethos level. And this is why, let me explain to you why there are so many miracles, signs and wonders recorded in the Bible, especially in the Gospel. They are there to convince you morally what is right and forever right, what is wrong and always wrong. What you should stay on the right side and stay away from the wrong side. This is the reason why the authors, they make sure they wrote down what Jesus has done in the supernatural, the healing, the casting out, the changing of situations, circumstances that by man's ability, we cannot change. But when Jesus came in, it can be changed. That is the ethos level. And it is being kept in the gospel, not without a reason. It is to convince you. Let me bring you back into the Bible. Do you remember Thomas? Thomas is one of the disciples of first twelve. When other disciples told him that Jesus had resurrected, came back to life, he still say, like many of us, are, no, lah, until, unless I see him, I won't believe that our Lord has come back to life. Thomas know Jesus, personal disciple. Knowledge-wise, emotional-wise, already in touch with Jesus. But still, he could not believe that Jesus has come back to life. You see, you look at what the Bible records for us. When he finally bent up with Jesus, Jesus asked him, look at my hand. Look at the holes in my hand. Look at the hole at the side of my body. And straight away, Thomas, the disciples, are convinced. No more excuses. He squat down, he bent down and worshipped Jesus, my Lord and my God. You see, for us to really rise up to be the quality, the standard of the first, the disciples of the first church, all of us, no exception, we have got to go through these three levels. In the church, we have got to promote, we have got to encourage that we have to move into the supernatural. Because many of us, I hope not all of us, are so stubborn. Even when our mind and our heart are connected with God, you are still not convinced, just like Thomas. Until you see a miracle, until you encounter the supernatural, you will not become the type of disciple in those days. That's why it is so fundamental, so important, that the church of today 
we should trust God and allow us to be surrounded by faith who dare to believe in the impossible and in the supernatural. Because for many of us, that is the only way for you to rise up, to be like the disciples of the first day. Can somebody say Amen? Do you want to see a miracle? Do you want to experience a miracle? You must understand the reason why the Gospels are being penned and recorded that way is so that our faith may arise. All the authors have their intention. They wrote the way so that you and me will benefit for all times. Amen? Shall we all rise now and let us pray? Father, we want to thank you this morning. Lord, it is so relevant that this morning we hear a word about how we could become a true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come before Thee with our confessions. If we have not been the kind of disciples that You want us to be, Lord, we are sorry. Lord, we ask that from this morning as Your Word has been opened up unto us, help us to relook at ourselves and re-evaluate ourselves especially in our relationship with you, because the disciples of Jesus Christ are so fundamental to your will for this world. Your purpose are carried out through your disciples. Your name are carried by your disciples. Your glory are seen through the disciples of Jesus Christ. Father, help us to live our life that is worthy of your calling. Let us not look back anymore, but to look forward, knowing, Lord, that you are the one that is going to make a difference in each one of us. That we have been so fortunate to be chosen, to be recruited, to be your disciples for the world. Father, help each one of us to live every day victoriously. That we may experience breakthrough and overcoming and overcoming. This morning, Father, before we leave here, let your word come alive in us. Help us to take ownership of your word so that your living word will be reflected in everything that we say and do so that the people of the world can recognize that we are different. We are special people because we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. So Lord, once again, thank you. All glory belongs to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.